Let's look at England then. Uh, we'll be very briefly in the next, um, well, it depends how long it takes, in the next 50 minutes or so, survey the sort of main developments in the British Isles, Britain and Ireland, uh, in terms of Viking activity primarily. And just to be Anglo-centric, we shall begin with England. So here is a rough chronology I've prepared uh, of some of the big events and periods and so on, and we shall refer to this, but also we'll jump to some quotations from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and we'll have a little look at the map which I've got up here, which you can see, which um, uh, the dates and activities marked here from the 9th century uh, relate partly to what we're saying. The dots are place names in England which are either entirely Scandinavian in origin or at least partly Scandinavian origin. They have uh, names of, uh, they obviously reflect some kind of uh, Viking presence and so on. And that map will hopefully become a bit clearer by the time we've done the chronology. The first arrival of, or the first recorded arrival of Vikings in England is seven 89 or thereabouts, it's perhaps a little bit vague, we can't be too specific. And it comes from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the version I have slightly later translation, so they're slightly different, but more or less the same. Okay, and in my version it's been corrected to 789. In this year, King Beortric took Yadbur, uh, the daughter of Offa, uh, to wife, which means he married her. Okay. In his days, so we're not getting a specific point, but some point round this time during his rule, uh, came uh, the first three ships of the Northmen. In my translation, it specifically says Norwegians. And here it says, from the land of the robbers. In my version, it says Hjortholand. The Reeve, who was a local official, then rode thereto, up to them, uh, and would drive them to the king's town. Now that's, again, interesting translation. My one says, and then the reed, reeve rode thither and tried to compel them to go to the royal manor. Okay. Um, For he knew not what they were, and there was he slain. These were the first ships of the Danish men that sought the land of the English nation. Okay. So according to the Anglo-Saxon chroniclers, Okay, this is the first arrival of the Vikings. And it, in a sense, it would seem that way. Why? I mean, what would support the suggestion that uh, there had not been significant Viking activity in England before this time? There may have been some, but not a lot. Not well known. Well, if they're concerned about writing about it now, you would have thought they would have written about it well, yeah, okay, they may have, I mean, but we don't actually have to recall that they like to have this is the first one and so on. Um, but the key, for me anyway, was the phrase, for he knew not what they were, okay? If there had been a number of reported uh, instances of kind of Scandinavians arriving and attacking people, then the Reeve probably wouldn't have gone up to them and said, please come to the royal manor, because he would have been suspicious that they might try and kill him or something like that, okay? So he had no idea what they were up to. So whether there were earlier ones or not, okay, this was very early in the process, which is why this unfortunate Reeve probably was uh, ignorant of their intentions, whatever that might have been. Okay. Oh, I could have just jumped back. Uh, more famously, in a sense, in terms of uh, European uh, perspective, was the attack on Lindisfarne, Holy Island, off the coast of Northumbria in 793. We have that again on, from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, because it's presented in a very strong way. So now we're here. This year came dreadful forewarnings over the land of the Northumbrians, terrifying the people most woefully. These were immense sheets of light rushing through the air, which means thunder and lightning, I suppose, but it's a nice way to put it, and whirlwinds and fiery dragons across the firmament, across the sky. These tremendous tokens were soon followed by a great famine. Not long after, on the sixth day before the Ides of January, 
in the same year, the harrowing inroads of heathen men made lament, lament, lamentable havoc in the Church of God in Holy Island. Oh, it's not marked on this map. Let's see if we've got another map that got there. Okay, we're talking up here, okay, uh, by rapine and slaughter. And we're not concerned about what Siga is doing. Uh, this was such a famous attack on a church that Alcuin, who was an Anglo-Saxon scholar uh, in the court of Charlemagne, uh, then still king rather than emperor, heard about it and uh, wrote back to his friends all oh, its terrible news and things like that. So it sort of spread through Europe, uh, what's going on and so on. And of course they've presented it in this very kind of poetic way with these portents, with these terrible things happening before. Again, this is some, this is a kind of literary topos uh, with uh, parallels in uh, uh, other writings where you, sh you present a big event and you say terrible things happened in advance or whatever and things like that. So all the thunder and weather are meant to kind of point forward to uh, this terrible event and so on. So this is the first big one on a church. Well, they were all, well, no, I mean, obviously, we're not going to be looking at what's going on in, um, in France here, but obviously, the Frankish lands were being attacked as well. Uh, and uh, people didn't really have that kind of level of cooperation, I don't suppose, in those days. It wasn't the way that they thought, in a sense. And the same Vikings were sometimes moving from one place to the other. So a gang of Vikings would leave northern France and then end up in England. So the French probably just sort of said, Whew! Got to be rid of them, leave them to see what they do to the English for a while and uh, things like that. Um, okay, and then we get a series of references and so on and attacks and raids by uh, Vikings uh, during the first half of the 9th century. I haven't given those here. We jump right up here in the small print to 850 um, because that was the first year uh, when the Vikings are said to have wintered in, uh, in England. So what had happened before was that they are probably fairly small and fast-moving raiding parties coming in on their ships, attacking Lindisfarne and other places, moving around a little bit, and then when it comes to winter, uh, okay, when uh, they're, they can be less active, they are leaving England and elsewhere and heading back, presumably heading back home to Scandinavia. Um, but for the first time in the middle of the uh, ninth century, uh, an army, uh, a group of Vikings decides rather than to go back, they may as well stay here and they set up uh, a camp or whatever. And we see similar events, in fact, slightly earlier, for example, in Ireland as well and elsewhere. So this is a kind of big point. It moves, means a transition from distance raiding, kind of in and out, to a more kind of organized uh, activity and the first time when they actually feel they're going to settle down even if only as a, uh, to can carry on raiding and so on. Then I move into what I've given here as the bigger font, okay, 865, the arrival of the Great Army, sometimes called just the Army, okay. And this is also the first time that we get payment of the Danegeld by the King of Kent. Danegeld means something like Dane payment, okay, to the Vikings. And basically it's kind of, I suppose, like, um, uh, protection, the protection racketeering, like, I don't know, the guys you get in, uh, image you get of in America of, uh, of guys like Al Capone or these kind of mafia guys saying, you know, pay us money and we'll make sure that your shop doesn't get burnt next week. <laughs> and then the guy says, yeah, yeah, here's the money and things like that. Okay, Joey, and so on. Um, and so effectively this is it. It's a kind of tribute payment, okay, to pay the Vikings off. And the Vikings are quite happy. They get money, and they don't obviously endanger their own lives for a while. And then they'll uh, expect a regular uh, periodic payment. So it's the first recorded evidence of this kind of uh, arrangement being set up. So things are slowly moving up to the next level. It's not just guys coming in and out, attacking. Then they're setting up a little base. And now they're establishing some more kind of financial uh, relationship that's, being, uh, that's going on as well. Also during the 860s, 870s, this is when we get 
the crumbling of the English uh, political situation, when we see the, the disappearance of the kingdoms that we've been, that we looked at a few weeks ago, one by one almost, uh, with the notable exception of Wessex. The West Saxon kingdom survives, the others were either destroyed or, or reduced in size and so on, and Wessex forms the core of the ultimate resistance or whatever uh, against the Vikings. So what have we got? Uh, this is again the activities of this great army uh, still active in England. Okay, 866 to 70, this is when Northumbria is uh, conquered uh, and then they set up a puppet king, someone who's basically working for them, paying tribute and so on. 869, they attack East Anglia. So we're over, sorry, here. Okay. And uh, King Edmund Martyr is killed, okay, famous event. 871, uh, just mentioned this in passing, but King Alfred, ultimately Alfred the Great, uh, becomes king of the West Saxons. During that time as well, okay, they fail to conquer Wessex, the first failure against Wessex. 872-4, Mercia, so in the Midlands, is conquered, and again they set up a puppet king for a while. Then, 874, the great army splits into kind of two parts, okay? On the one hand, we have Halfdan, on the other hand, Guthrum, Osketel, and Anundur, uh, forming kind of different groups. Halfdan focuses on Northumbria. He establishes himself as ruler there, so maybe there's some independent kind of English rule still in the north of Northumbria, but the large part of Northumbria, including the city of York, is now under his rule. And therefore, we also see major settlement of Danes there. Okay, this is what we've got marked here, okay? This settlement of people, not just conquer. And this is what the Anglo-Saxon, how the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes that, if we can jump back. This is what I'm after. It's 876 in this one. This is what I'm trying to get. Okay, so it's the same period. Um, in the same year, Halfdan divided the land of the Northumbrians, okay, took part of it, and then they came afterwards uh, their harrowers and plowers. So this refers to agricultural activity. Okay, that's the key there. That uh, we have not just uh, attacking and settlement, but they're making themselves more permanent there. They're actually uh, cultivating the land. Again, they fail to defeat Alfred in Wessex. 877, uh, we get significant settlement in uh, Mercia. That gets split into two parts and the eastern part is taken over by the Vikings, so we're talking this area kind of here primarily, okay, and settled as well. Further uh, failure to defeat uh, Wessex, and in this case, Alfred has kind of come back from a rather difficult position, and now he's, he fixes uh, peace with Guthrum, okay, and it's the first uh, uh, negotiation uh, where he has kind of upper hand. And then uh, following s uh, a decade we have more Viking activity and they form a second piece. And this is when they establish formally what we call the Dane law, which means an area where the law of the Danish people is uh, most uh, uh, prominent. And so we're talking about this line here. Anything north of that line in this region Alfred said, OK, you can have that, and we'll call that the area where the law of the Danes is established. And south of that line, OK, is primarily going to be uh, under my influence, OK, which is kind of Wessex and, and elsewhere, and so on. So 
Alfred's reign and this, this point in the creation of the Dane law marks the final stage in what we've been looking at. Finally, we have political activity. Okay, they're now acting politically. We've had raiding, followed by kind of wintering, followed by um, uh, 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 taking over kingdoms, and finally they have uh, diplomatic relations almost, and, a, and, a, and an almost official recognition uh, of, their, of the situation. Um, and Wessex uh, down here uh, forming the kind of non bit. And all the dots you can see, with some small exceptions creeping over the border, all the dots marking Scandinavian place names and suggesting, therefore, Scandinavian points of settlement and activity are to the north and east of the Danelaw boundary. And with a few exceptions, there is no strong evidence of Scandinavian settlement, at least in terms of place names uh, south. So that's, it shows that the boundary, the political boundary which they, uh, that Guthrum and Alfred uh, established was quite effective, okay? That there was very significant Viking movement into this area. Um, and nothing going on here. So it did work in that sense, this division. What happens in the 10th century is that Alfred's successors uh, succeed in slowly extending English, West Saxon English power uh, into the Dane law and destroying uh, the Viking uh, political power there. But that's quite a, a long story and we'll look at that another time. One other thing just to point out, which doesn't crop up in great detail, but in addition to these great uh, army activities that we've been talking about, in addition and perhaps emanating from Ireland, we have a series of uh, settlements by primarily Norwegians, we think, along the west coast of northern England, okay, significantly in what we call the Wirral and Lancashire, we have records of that, but also the place names point to other settlements that we don't have uh, so much reference to as well. So the stuff in the Chronicle is primarily here, and this is a sort of separate, perhaps, uh, movement or activity that we can see. This leads to a number of things. Settlement means people are coming in, it means population is changing, it means language might be changing, culture is changing as well. It marks out a separation between perhaps the north and the south. We see evidence even today of the influence of the Old Norse Viking language on England, on English. Okay? Uh, now I've mentioned this I'm sure in front of Erzge, but she may not remember. What very important element in English vocabulary and grammar, uh, in fact, owes its origin to the Vikings, which I may or may not have mentioned last year, and obviously I can't expect you to remember that. But the plural third person pronoun, they, their, and them, and so on, uh, that is in fact, they are in fact Viking words, ultimately. Because in English, the equivalent word, hair, and so on, beginning with an H sound, could be confused with he and words for she and so on. Uh, and so gradually in the later Middle Ages, uh, the use of the the, they words s s crept southwards and then is now the, is the only form of those pronouns in English. Okay. So this, is a, this reflects a significant linguistic impact of the Vikings in the north and then later on the impact of that form of Middle English uh, in the south as well. It's quite an important point. People have studied the place names on these maps. Uh, for example, try to argue in some areas the Vikings perhaps occupied, not took over directly English settlements, but occupied new lands. Uh, so they were living side by side perhaps with uh, English people and things like that. And we've got DNA studies. I'll mention more about DNA when we come to Scotland in particular. But there's been some studies of they're saying there's some evidence of Viking DNA, for example, they found in those regions as well, and so on. Um, and so there's been attempts to study the nature of these settlements as well. But for uh, the 9th and the 10th century, we see this gradual shift in, in Viking activity, and eventually we see political conquest. And we see guys calling themselves king uh, of York, 
okay, uh, ruling uh, and having connections with other Viking kingdoms elsewhere. So the political map of England uh, more or less changed uh, during the period of about 20 years or so. And we'll follow up the remaining of that story next time. Okay, let's shift to Ireland now, which is also an interesting, has an interesting picture. The map I showed before, I have my own map somewhere. Uh, maybe I can put that one up here if I can find my, my map. Fit onto here. Not so, let's make it a bit bigger, maybe it'll be clearer. The story in Ireland is similar to what goes in England, or goes on in England that we've just seen, similar sort of main trends and so on. The first recorded Viking raid onto Ireland is traditionally placed at 795. Okay. And so this is a couple of years after the great attack on Lindisfarne in England, and um, a little bit later than that attack uh, by those Vikings against the Reeve that we mentioned before. During the following 30 or so years, we see a similar pattern as in England. These hit and run attacks, these summertime, springtime raids by Vikings primarily, but not exclusively, on church sites around the coast especially, okay? Or pushing in uh, 20 miles or so inland and following up some of the rivers and so on and things like that, okay? So a similar pattern of uh, short-term raiding uh, and plundering and so on. And they're recorded effectively in the annals. From about 830, this kind of raiding becomes more serious. They move further inland. They establish um, uh, more plans and so on. They go further up the rivers and things like that and move to some of these large inland lakes, the lochs, that are referred to in the Irish sources. And then from about 840, they begin to set up settlements, temporary settlements perhaps, sometimes called long forts, that's the uh, technical term uh, for these settlements, perhaps on lakes or on the edges of rivers or on the coast and so on. Uh, so just as in about 850 the Vikings are wintering for the first time in England, during the sort of decade or so before we see the beginnings of a more permanent or semi-permanent uh, series of bases for Viking activity in Ireland. And some of these long forts go on to become the main cities of modern Ireland. Okay, most significantly, of course, Dublin, uh, which is the capital city, but also other places like Limerick, and Waterford, and so on, have their origin in these uh, Viking uh, temporary or semi-permanent settlements that they set up uh, during this period and later. Okay, there will be fortified settlements uh, which they use as bases for raiding and again so they don't have to go home during the winter and so on. This is the period we were looking at before now and we see for example that reference to somewhere being attacked by the Vikings and the Irish and it's during this period we see also the first time that the Vikings and the Irish sometimes will work together. So again we're getting a shift from their being somehow completely alien and outside to be the beginning to becoming integrated vaguely into the uh, uh, Irish scene, though full integration, if that's, not, if that's not the right way of putting it, comes a bit later on. 853, I'm just looking at the dates I've written down here. A Viking in English called Olaf the White with connections to the guys in England as well, set up as King of Dublin. Okay, um, So we get the beginnings of the emergence of Dublin as a kind of Viking kingdom. And I know it's very clear here, but in addition to the kind of main city itself, uh, we see the growth of uh, a kind of hinterland region under the influence of the city, uh, 
and not necessarily quite like this at this point. So it forms a sort of small little kingdom area with the city or town, Longford, as the focus, and that emerges later on and so on. So somewhat differently than England in terms of settlement, we don't get a period of significant large-scale settlement. The Viking towns primarily dotted around the coast. Okay, occasionally they'll be occupying long forts that may or may not become more permanent on uh, the uh, uh, lakes as well. But primarily it's a small sort of focus uh, of a town with a hinterland dotted around the coast. Uh, we don't see large-scale migration of people into Ireland in the way that we saw with uh, this map for England, for example. There's not, nothing comparable to that. And they've done genetic tests, and again, I guess there's more work to be done, but there's one article I read where uh, they took people whose modern surnames have got Scandinavian elements. So someone's called Mac. Uh, Tory or something, and that might come from Thoria or something. So they think maybe the ancestor of that person may have been uh, a Viking, a Scandinavian. It's no way of being guaranteeing that. So they took a lot of Irish people who have um, uh, supposed Scandinavian uh, ancestors, at least in terms of their surnames, and they also took some people who were just ordinary Irish surnames, and they looked at their uh, genetic makeup, Y chromosomes in this case, and the amount of Viking DNA was very, very low, even for these guys who are supposedly uh, having Scandinavian names. So that suggests that there was, and we can see this here, there was not large-scale uh, influx of uh, Vikings uh, as settlers in Ireland, um, and that uh, even large kingdoms like Dublin eventually, or even quite early on, were perhaps composed of both Vikings, but also a lot of Irish men who just got involved and perhaps presumably learned Old Norse and became part of, of that scene, so that the uh, Vikings did not form a significant um, demographic influx into Ireland during this period. So a different situation uh, than we see in England, or we have seen. Okay, any questions there? I'm trying to be quick so we can get through Scotland and Wales as well. So let's move to Scotland now. I've got a few maps. That's the Welsh one. We don't need that one. Um, we only really need one of these maps. So let's see if this one works on here. Maybe it's better on the thing. Let's move on here. Okay, these are, uh, again, the dots mark settlements of um, uh, Scandinavian uh, uh, origin, at least in terms of the names, in what is now Scotland. Um, a few things to say. The Scottish situation is quite mixed, quite different. So we've got to say, for example, these two regions called Shetland and Orkney, okay, perhaps very early on had had influence from Norway. If I find a map that can show uh, more clearly here. Nor Norwegians coming towards Britain would be hitting the north of Scotland and these islands who don't figure significantly in historical sources till later. Okay, so what's going on there during the 8th century, we don't know. But they're very much within the world view of these Norwegians who are also, perhaps via Britain, moving into the Faroe Islands and then Iceland. Okay, so they're in an interesting kind of situation. And eventually we see the creation of the uh, earldom of Orkney uh, set up in this region. These significant settlements in Caithness, presumably part of that movement as well. Then we have the Western Islands, the Hebrides, the area where the uh, original Irish Gaelic Scot settlers were. Okay. Also, we see a lot of place names of uh, Scandinavian origin. And then this little group here from 
uh, overlapping from northern England in a sense, we're uh, less concerned about them. And uh, it's further down here, but the Western Islands also connected to the Isle of Man that was located down there, okay, part of that line of activity. So two kind of areas, the Western Isles and the, um, uh, the Orkneys and Shetlands uh, as a separate group in a sense with Caithness connected to them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in Orkneys and Shetland, uh, there was enough settlement by Vikings that a form of the Norwegian or Old Norse, which we call Norn, persisted perhaps into the 18th or even into the 19th centuries, but decreasingly so. And it was quite late on that uh, those islands became part of Scotland, the Kingdom of Scotland, as opposed to uh, a separate uh, uh, Viking area under Norwegian influence. Harold Finehair, the guy I mentioned earlier, <coughs> is said to have decided he was fed up with Scandinavian Vikings attacking Norway from these two islands. They were a base for uh, raids not only into Britain but back into Scandinavia. So then he sent a few ships over and said, okay, we're taking over here, we're going to set up a, an earldom and they're going to be answerable to me. Okay, we don't want these uh, Viking pirates attacking us. So it's interesting that Vikings, of course, could attack either way. So they set up this earldom there, and that's presumably when we even get more influx of uh, settlement and so on. They've done DNA tests. There's another article uh, studying the DNA of these areas. They found the Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA of the Shetlands and Orkneys are quite significantly somewhere just below 50% Scandinavian. So that shows a lot of Viking settlement of both men and women in those areas. However, for the Hebrides, we see a higher degree of Y chromosomes and far fewer Viking mitochondrial DNA amongst the current occupants of these areas. What might that suggest? What's the nature of what's going on here then? If we get a higher degree of Y and less mitochondrial DNA, what does that tell us or what it might tell us about Viking presence and settlement in the Hebrides, for example? Okay, let me put that on because, okay. Y chromosome is high, relatively high, I mean still less than in Shetland or whatever, and mitochondrial DNA is significantly less Viking. Okay. Yes, uh, so it's a more of a mixed kind of, at least ethnically or whatever the word is, uh, society. It's Viking men, Vikings seeking their fortunes and then eventually settling and finding a wife and obviously taking uh, a local woman as a wife or whatever relationship they had, we don't know of course. Whereas up there in the Shetlands and the Orkneys, we see obviously a more organized and more uh, full settlement by both men and women coming in. Okay. And this, I think the percentages are, di uh, percentages are different, obviously, but also in uh, Iceland, they see far less uh, Viking mitochondrial DNA and a higher percentage of British, which means Irish and British, uh, DNA in Iceland, and the same in the Faroe Islands as well. So um, the, the settlements of uh, the Faroe Islands, more importantly perhaps Iceland, okay, again was made up of Viking men with women coming along uh, from the British Isles, so this stepping stone idea and so on, rather than a full-scale uh, settlement, organized settlement by uh, Vikings coming in and things like that. So again, I don't know how often I'm going to still go on about DNA. I think this might be the last time I'll mention much DNA. But uh, again, I find it because I find it very interesting, it gives a new perspective on uh, what the historical and onomastic sources can tell us about uh, the history of that period. And lastly, and to some extent least significantly, my 
homeland in Wales. Here is a map showing Viking place names in what is now Wales. It has a very interesting um, distribution. Any ideas what this might or might not tell us? We've got plenty of references, not plenty, but we've got a number of references to Viking attacks on Welsh churches. Again, mostly churches dotted around the coastland because that's where they're coming in. Um, but we also have these uh, place names, many of them still uh, um, uh, used today, some of them uh, no longer used. Uh, and we see a small number along the north coast and a higher percentage along the south coast of Wales. Any thoughts what might be going on here? Maybe before when they were raiding, before they actually set up the settlements, maybe the southern coast were more rich and popular. And then once they started settling, maybe they were also better areas for agriculture. Well, it could be, yeah. I mean, uh, there's quite a lot of settlement. This is quite a rich area and so on. I mean, OK, we haven't got time to look at all the names in detail. We've got some places like Axton. Okay, or Kelston up there, and a few clocks to here. Tan, tan is an English word for settlement. Okay, so it's a settlement of sorts. But a lot of them, if we look very closely, okay, Orm's Head. I've been there plenty of times. It's just it's it's near the town called uh, the seaside town called Llandidno. It's just on the end of this land that sticks out, and it's not somewhere where you'd necessarily settle. But it's a significant feature on the coastline. Okay, it's a big point on the coastline. And we've got places, the scars and the rocks and these islands and things like that. So what's been suggested is that um, what the Vikings were primarily, though not only, interested in, but was indicating points along the coast for making sure you understand where you're going, for navigating the coast. Okay, For those involved in trade, perhaps into England via uh, Chester, and for later on, this would lead us up to Bristol. For moving out from that, those uh, lines into Dublin and the Irish Sea and so on. Okay? Marking out the coast, understanding the coast, is one way of uh, explaining perhaps some of these. So they may not even refer exclusively to settlements, okay? rather than to the names given by Vikings and then later English people who followed them along these trade routes, these sailing routes, okay, just understanding the Welsh coast. Now it has been suggested by uh, some historians more recently that uh, there was more Viking sort of settlement, particularly I mean, for a lot in North Wales in Anglesey up there, okay, that's been argued. There's a little bit of archaeological evidence and the way we interpret the historical evidence might point in that direction. But uh, in general Wales seems to have been uh, far less settled than we see in England, than we've seen in parts of Scotland at least, and that to some extent we've seen dotted around the Irish coast politically, if not in terms of population. I haven't come across any genetic attempts to understand if we have evidence of Viking DNA in these areas and so on. I don't think that's been undertaken. But uh, Wales uh, was attacked and raided. There were a few attempts at kind of fighting against the, the Welsh kings and controlling them and so on. It didn't come to very much in the end. So Wales, uh, less of a Viking area, uh, but that might partly reflect the sources and things like that. OK, so what have we got here then? Politically, uh, just to round off, we've seen the beginnings of Viking activity in the British Isles with raiding. We've seen settlement and so on. By the 10th century, we, late 9th century, 10th century, we've got the Danelaw region in England. We've got uh, the north and eastern parts of what is now England dominated by Viking settlers. We see political developments there. We see Jorvik, which is the kind of Viking name for York, emerging as a very important uh, center of Viking activity in what had been Northumbria and so on. Uh, in Ireland, we see the creation of a number of these pseudo uh, kingdoms dotted around the coast, which eventually become the uh, 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 cities of Ireland to a large extent. In Scotland, we have 
uh, rulers in the Isle of Man and the Western Isles, and then separately we've got the uh, earldom, the Yaldom of the Orkneys in the north as well. So in addition to uh, attacking, in addition to settlement, we see some political impact by the Vikings on various parts of Britain. And as I said, for England, which we'll look at uh, in the next topic, starting uh, this time next week, we, shall, we can trace the gradual expansion of the West Saxon kingdom uh, and the creation of what becomes the kingdom of the English, England, as they uh, push back the Viking political power and reassert uh, Anglo-Saxon or English power in the north as well. Okay. Any questions? This is more or less where I wanted to reach today. So on uh, Tuesday next week, we'll talk about uh, Viking um, religion and particularly their pagan religion and their myths and so on. Uh, some of the things we've mentioned already in passing when we referred to Anglo-Saxon gods will sound familiar, I hope. And I've got a few other little points to make, but we'll focus on uh, editor's uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. See you all uh, next week. Keep away from swine flu, wash your hands and all the other things we've been advised to do. Otherwise, have a nice weekend. And if you get time, go and see that movie because I said I think the story, the original book,